Hello, everybody. Um, I think it's been a wonderful spring. Personally, the, the wildflowers have been fantastic. I think the, the cool weather has had a lot to do with it. Um, I actually started back to work this week, and we have a wedding to go to today. So we're easing back into real life. Um, I have a checklist when I go back to work. I do stay away from people and I do wear a mask. Most of the time when I'm working, people flee the room anyway and stay as far away from me as possible. It's a humble job, tuning pianos. Um, you know, um, I, I remember one time I, I used to throw fits occasionally. I'd say, you know, I was thinking of the university where every note that got played in a recital was thanks to my work. And I would say, I don't get any thanks. I do all this kind of work around here and people take advantage of it and nobody notices. And then one day a woman turned to me and said, you know, it sounds to me like you're ready to be a wife and mother now. And um, I, uh, I stopped ranting at that point. That we all have our jobs to do and we fit in the way that we fit. Um, tuning is a... Uh, it has steps to it. The first thing you do when you get there after you greet the customer and pet the dog is you, um, you fix what needs to be fixed. You see what's broken and you fix it. And then you affect the sound of the piano and you, um, you have standards. I have a pitch on my, on my iPhone that I compare the piano to and I, I set that first pitch and then I do the rest of it by ear. But there are laws and there are rules and we bring the piano in to confirmation with those laws and that's what that's what makes that's how we know when we've we've done our job um, when the piano is lined up with the rules of physics at that point and pleases the human ear but then after that you think you're done but you have one more job to do and that is you have to make it beautiful you've already made it right but there's still things you can do you can voice it you can um, settle the strings in places, you can change the action, you can get rid of creaks and squeaks and things like that. And you make it as beautiful as you possibly can. And then at the end, the idea is that people are happy and they pay you to go away. It's a win-win thing. So this is the way that I'm re-emerging from the shutdown. I have checklists to follow. And um, we're all going to, over the next few weeks and months and who knows how long it will be? We don't know exactly what the plan is at this point, but we're going to be re-entering the world from this shutdown. We're going to see human nature at its best and at its worst, and we're already seeing those things. Um, I thought about reading a list to you of the horrible things that people have done, and then I thought, no, that's a terrible thing to do to these people because everybody's already stressed and everybody's already feeling that kind of thing, and 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 uh, you have an ear out for that, and you're hearing too much that kind of news you know about it and I don't want to um, I don't want to minimize it because it's happening there are also people at their best people helping all kinds of people um, people like Maria Raspovich who goes to work in spite of all the things that that are in her life at this point um, there are many people who are doing selfless things and um, you know I I used to think when, when I was young, and, and God bless young people when they think this way, because it's a fairly normal way of thinking. When I was uh, in my late teens, early 20s, because um, it, was, it was the 60s, we were an idealistic people in those days. And I had it in my head that human beings, deep down, were intelligent beings. And if you dug far enough, you could find kindness and goodness in everyone. I've recovered from that most admirably. I no longer believe that kind of thing. Um, I, I just assume people are stupid and dumb and bad. And then when they're nice to me and they're wonderful, it's just a pleasant surprise. Uh, it's fantastic. I have a, a cartoon here that came up on my Facebook page and it's actually a cartoon from May 16th, a couple of years ago. And it's, it's the comic strip, Pearls Before Swine. I was gonna hold it up to the camera and then I realized at least on my screen, it comes backwards. So I'll just read it to you, but Pearls Before Swine, there's a rat who's one of the bad guys and there's a pig who's one of the happy, simpler folk. And the rat says, in an effort to minimize the impact of all the idiots in the world, I declare today, May 16th, to be, try not to be as stupid as you normally are, day. And the pig says, 
I don't like to think of anyone as idiots because I think every single human on earth has value and something to contribute. And the rat looks at the pig and says, I see you're not observing the holiday. Well, thankfully, there are wonderful people and God calls them. There are wonderful people who aren't called to God's family at this point. And this kind of situation can separate the, the, um, the people who are, who are at their best from the people who are doing their worst. Um, of course, we all know the verses in, in 2 Timothy about in the last days, perilous times shall come. Those are um, in our memory, but let's turn to the first letter of Timothy where Paul, who is mentoring this relatively young man, um, has other things to say to him, and it's kind of along those lines. In 1 Timothy and chapter 6, um, starting in verse 2, the end of verse 2, right before verse 3, there's a little phrase where it says, teach and urge these duties. And it's, it's urging people to, to keep order and respect for their masters and things like that. And in verse 3, Paul says, whoever teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that is in accordance with godliness, and godliness is what we're after, is conceited, understanding nothing, and has a morbid craving for controversy and for disputes about words. From these come envy, dissension, slander, base suspicions, and wrangling among those who are depraved in mind and bereft of the truth. And what you have there from 2,000 years ago is a fairly accurate description of Facebook today. Uh, people go on, and you know, some people post the bread that they've baked or the flowers in their backyard, but other people are, here's what you should do, or here's what I believe, or it's all a conspiracy, and there's arguments. And, and then my favorite line is, I don't want to argue, which means that they, they're determined that they're right and they're going to tell you what to do. And I, um, I think there's value to being on Facebook, so I stay on and stay positive. And I found out that you can unfollow those people and never see their posts again. Technology is a wonderful thing. But um, that's just one example. Times of trial like this expose people's character. The good will continue to do good, and the evil will, do continue, will continue to do evil. There's a psalm that all of you have in your heart. I know this. Even your, the young people in, in, who are listening right now, even the, the people who can't remember where they put their car keys, remember this psalm. But just in case you don't, let's turn to Psalm 1. The very first psalm in the easiest to find book of the Bible, because it's the longest one. And of course, we sing this often in a fairly joyful song, and it's, we know it as blessed and happy is the man. Um, the, the actual words from the Bible are a little different, because you have to juggle them around um, to make a hymn out of them. But um, the meaning is the same. And I'm, I'm actually reading this out of the New Revised Standard, but thankfully it's book to the other translations. It says, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. And trees are absolutely wonderful things, and we can all relate to that. Let's have some trees here. Here's some trees. Hi. There's trees. Okay. And these are tall trees growing by the riverside, and they're doing quite well. And then it says, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff. The wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Well, I wonder if you've thought about this. We think of this as a psalm about great prosperity and calm times and happiness, but I don't think that's what it is. Because in times of prosperity and um, evenness of the world going along as it is, everybody's that tree that grows by the riverside. Everybody has food, everybody has a job, everybody has the things that they need, and everybody does well and they prosper. It's in times of trouble that these things matter and the wicked are separated from the good at this point. Because it's, it's at times like this that we pray that God will have us be the trees that grow by the riverside, that we will be prosperous and blessed in every way, and that we will still yield fruit. 
And now that things have gotten tough for a lot of people, it's separating the uh, trees from, from the chaff that the wind drives away, as the psalm says. There's a, uh, there's a scripture that is very parallel to this, and, and um, we turn to this scripture for other reasons, not because of the parallel, but let's turn to it for the parallel. And it's in uh, the book of Jeremiah, where the prophet Jeremiah is speaking the word of the Lord. And we're in Jeremiah 17. And if you're like me, Jeremiah 17 goes ding, 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 because there's a verse in Jeremiah 17 that we learned very early on in our, in our um, membership in the God family. Uh, and it's about the human spirit. But, but let's start in verse 7. And Jeremiah was to point out the sin of the nation of Judah. And, and Israel. Um, that's what he did. And God said, you better do it. And if you don't do it, um, you're in trouble. So he had quite a bit of pressure on him. He had, uh, he had things that he had to do. But he's telling them, and when you read the beginning of this, of this verse, he's telling them how terrible their sins are. But down in verse 7, and these are very familiar words, he says, blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and that's what's happening now, and its leaves shall stay green in the year of drought, and that's what it is now. It is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. All is well, right? Well, boom. The next verse is the one that, that I was thinking of, and the one that's embedded in our hearts, and it's as far distant from, from those, the tone of those other verses as can be. Although actually it's connected, and that's why Jeremiah says it next. In verse 9, he says, The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And that's one way of summing up people. It agrees with the rat in Pearls Before Swine. And it's in the face of this beautiful picture of a tree. Well, God gives the, the opposite right before that in verse 5. Thus says the Lord to Jeremiah, Cursed are those who, tr who trust in mere mortals and who make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. And so one group lives in the de desert and one group lives in water right by the river. What a big contrast. Well, you know what? A person can live in the desert right next door to the person who's the tree by the water. Because this isn't talking about the physical places they live. This is talking about the state of their heart in times of trouble. It can even happen in the same house. You can have one person who's the tree growing by the riverside and another person who lives in the parched wilderness because their heart withers. They're not exercising what God wants them to do. And these are times that will make that distinction in the human heart. And God exhorts us, if you turn to, to Jeremiah 24, God tells us what we have to do. In Jeremiah 24 and verse seven, he says, I will give them a heart, to, he's talking about the nation, but this applies to us too. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord. They shall be my people and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their heart. And in verse, chapter 32 of Jeremiah, there's a theme that goes through what God tells Jeremiah to say in chapter 32 and verse 39. Come on, fingers. 32 and 39, verse 39. God says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me for all time for their own good. And their own good meaning there'll be those trees growing by the riverside so that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing good to them. And I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and with all my soul. You know, people who, who do public speaking in church, who give sermons and sermonettes, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can speak for everyone, but we, we give sermons about what we need too. We speak to people about what will help people in general. We also speak about what we need. And right now, I need to stay close to God, and I need to be that tree growing by the riverside, and I need to go through the checklist that God gives us and give this sermon to myself and come out of this as we re-enter the world, come out of lockdown, but come out of this closer to God than before.
In Matthew 5 and verse 3, Jesus was on earth on a very nice day, sitting on a hillside, talking to people. And Jesus was looking for people at this point. He was looking for people for his kingdom. He was looking for people to actually just help him with the job that he had to do. And he goes through a list, and we know it well. In verse 3 of Matthew 5, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And then in verse 10 and 11, there's potential things that can happen in these times for us. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for those theirs is the kingdom of heaven. People who are trying to be that tree and the, the people who live in the parched desert don't want it. And verse 11, Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Which sounds a lot like a lot of the conspiracy theories we're hearing today and the accusations that are being made on Facebook and the squabbling and the bickering. And that's something we really want to, be, want to avoid. But at the same time, you know, when people behave badly, there's reason to rejoice. In verse 12 of this chapter, it says, Rejoice and be glad when people treat you this way, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, that's not something I strive to achieve, uh, is being persecuted like the prophets before me. I'd sort of like to go through life avoiding that in any way, be a conscientious objector to the whole thing. But the fact that people are misbehaving and some people, I, I wish to point out, of course, there are many people who are serving as a wonderful example, and the, they're uplifting, but there are also people who misbehave. And the more the pressure is on, the more misbehaving and evil in people's hearts you will see, and thinking of themselves and not of other people. There is a reason to actually rejoice about that, and that's that the way we're doing it is right, that there is a world and there is a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things and we're standing behind the God who is teaching the world the right way to do things and if everybody did things the right way it would mean that that our life was unnecessary and not full of meaning but the fact that people can go either way uh, distills the whole thing before our eyes that there was a right way and what we want to do is tell people about it and have them come to God and be in his family and be part of that so even there, there's a reason to rejoice. We live for a kingdom to come. And when Jesus Christ returns, he has a checklist to follow, just like we will have a checklist. Let's turn to Isaiah 61. And these are verses that you know well. I often turn to them because they mean so much to me. Isaiah 61. And Jesus quoted these verses about his work when he came to earth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, verse 1, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted. The first thing he does when he goes into a customer's house is he fixes what needs to be fixed. And in Isaiah chapter 35, again, this is a chapter that many of us probably have memorized because it's a chapter of hope and beauty. It talks about him making the earth a beautiful place. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. And then down in verse 5, it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstop, and the lame shall leap, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. And the desert will be fixed. The first thing he does is bind up the broken and fix what needs to be fixed. The next thing he does, and we can read about this in Isaiah 11 and in many, many other places, is is when that is done, and, and actually at the same time that that's being done, he will bring the world back in line with the laws, with the things that make life right. Not just for the sake of, of obeying laws because you'll be blessed, but because there's a right way, and that's the way to happiness on earth. It's the way things were, were designed. And so it says in 
Isaiah 11, starting in verse 1, a shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. And we know that that refers to him being in the family of David. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness. With the law of God, he will judge the poor. He will decide with equity. It'll be the same for everybody, for the meek of the earth. He will strike the earth with the mouth, rod of his mouth, because sometimes you have to use a little oomph to get that, that world in tune, you know? There's things that he'll have to do that, that will not be pleasant, and they, they won't be a good thing to be around for, but they're necessary. And in verse 5, righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. And then after that, he does one more thing. He makes the world even more beautiful. And it talks about the wolf living with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the lion and the fatling together. And in verse nine, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And if you go back to Isaiah 61, there is a further part of this commission, which was to Jesus Christ, but also to his church today because we're doing the work of Jesus at this point. And it talks about that further work. It says in verse two, we've already, <laughs> we've already proclaimed liberty to the captives and released to the prisoners. And he said, that's what he did when he came to earth. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, bringing the world back in line, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who mourn in Zion. Zion is not the whole world. Zion is God's people who are mourning because of the things that they see. And this is something that Jesus wants to do, but we get to do it too. And it should be something that we strive for today. I say these words to myself before I fall asleep at night. Sometimes I go over the fruits of the Spirit or the Ten Commandments, but this is one of those, those checklists that I check for re-entry into, into the right world, God's kingdom to provide for those who mourn in Zion. In other words, to make people uplifted, to give them a garland, or sometimes it says a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Ashes is mourning. Crown of beauty is happiness. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The mantle of praise, or sometimes it's called a garment of praise, instead of a faint spirit. Those are the things that we should be doing with this checklist. And we should be those people and people should see us and it should uplift them and inspire them, make them even want to be part of it. And then the next verse, they shall be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. So we're back to the trees. The trees are a theme that goes all the way through. You know, they were in the Garden of Eden. They're in the last part of Revelation. And this tree growing by the riverside is something that means very much to God. We will be called the Oaks of Righteousness because we're doing our best to live his way. It's also what we have to do. It's what distinguishes God's work in the end time. And these are very strange times right now. You know, for years we've been saying how awful things were, were, will be. And then, although I totally agree with Mr. Thomas's sermon last week, that we're not in the heart of the tribulation, things are getting weird, aren't they? Couldn't have predicted the way that they would be. I'm 67. This is the weirdest time I've lived through. Now, people who lived through World War II or the Great Depression might argue with me, but these are very, very strange times. And they're having an effect on people's behavior. Our behavior should contrast with other behavior. In fact, as I said, the bad behavior can give us something to rejoice about because it means there really is right or wrong and that there are things worth fighting for. And that's what God has called us to do. In Isaiah, verse 35 and verse 10, last scripture, that's what brings happiness to Zion is to say, last scripture. In this, these beautiful passages, it talks about that happiness and making the earth a happy place. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. People's hearts will be so full. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We're not there yet and we have a long way to go. But we need to keep these things close to our heart as the world changes all, changes all around us. We need to be 
part of God's program and we need to keep our heart into it.